Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm the Strategy Professor, and today I just wanted to hit on the topic of toxicity in League of Legends because this has been a really popular topic uh, for several weeks. It comes up every now and then, but uh, recently with Boy Boy's Twitter post about toxicity in League has gotten everybody talking. There's lots of other content creators talking about it, and now with kind of the high drama um, and how he's been treated, people are talking about it again. So I just want to give you my thoughts on this, and then I can reference this on stream anytime anyone wants my thoughts on it. Um, then we can come over to it. If you enjoy this content, please be sure to like and subscribe. It does help out a ton on the channel. I'm going to try to bring you guys more of these topical videos and just give you a little something every day, uh, if I can, or at least every other day. Because um, I know that people used to really love those like guides and topical conversations that I had. Um, but I just really haven't done those consistently in a while, and I've just kind of been focused on streaming, but... I will try to bring you more of these. We do stream every night, speaking of which, at 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on YouTube, so come by, check it out. Wonderful, very friendly community. I try to explain as much as I can about what's going on in the game while also trying to hold a conversation with the chat, talk about any questions or sharing any fun stories that I might have or that you might have. Okay, and we do have lots of other topical guides like this. Um, you know, like best one tricks, how to macro better, how to micro better, does luck exist in League of Legends, how does dodging work in League of Legends, all of those are on the channel, there's dozens and dozens of them, like I said, some of them are a little bit older, but they still um, can help you understand a lot about the game. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get in here. So I think the number one thing that's problematic about these conversations about toxicity, and I put it in quotes here because it's really hard to define exactly what it is, and that's why it's so hard to regulate it. So when people talk about toxicity, there are basically four categories of behavior in League of Legends that often gets classified as toxic, but each one of them has their own set of problems and their own potential solutions. I'm gonna to try to focus on both, explaining the problems and explaining potential solutions to it as well. So the four types of toxicity that I think most types of behavior that people complain about fall into are chat so, so this would be like personal attacks or just commentary on gameplay um, AFK so like the literal you just completely leave the game also you know running around in circles or running around in the jungle or just generally not participating in the game the other one um, and this one is the most difficult to categorize is um, inting so intentional feeding bad play, for fun play, and off meta play. And all of these often get conflated into one. So people think that if someone is just having a bad game and they just happen to go 0 and 8 because they get behind and they just don't know what to do and it's a really bad comp, you know, maybe they're playing Alistar support or something like that and their team just can't really ever engage and Alistar tries to make plays but just keeps dying. But they're honestly trying to win. They're just like having a really bad game <clears throat> you know that's one thing and then for fun picks to someone who is just trying out something a new all caps build they saw uh, you know on some website and they're trying it out for fun you know full AD crit Sandra middle or something like that um, and that kind of fits into off meta as well so just playing something your loose intention is to win the game but you're playing something that you do that you know is not going to give your team the best chance to win. And then there is the actual 100% trying to throw the game by intentionally feeding the enemy team, running it down middle, running it into them over and over again, um, split pushing at very unstrategic, very obvious times that you're trying to die over and over again. So a lot of times all of these get conflated into one thing, and, but they're separate instances with different problems and different potential solutions to them. So that's the one I'm going to spend the most time talking about in this video. And then related topics that are often similar to toxicity but aren't exactly the same thing as some of these other things are smurfing. I've got a whole section about smurfing I'll talk about, boosting, and win trading. Um, so we'll hit on those as well. But uh, first, let's just talk really quickly about why do we think that people are toxic in general? What leads League to make people feel toxic? And is, is League unique in this, or are there other games that are similar to this? Well, I think there are several things that League has going for it that can lead to behaviors that people often interpret as toxic. So number one, it's competitive. Somebody has to care about a game in order for it to be toxic. You know, uh, if it's something that is considered really casual, 
where no one has any sort of competitive aspirations in it. I, I don't know what it would be like. Maybe um, like Minecraft or I, I don't know. I, I don't play a lot of a lot of other games, but Minecraft or like single player games or stuff like that, where it's pretty obvious it's supposed to be for fun, is not going to be as toxic. League is one of the most competitive games for several reasons. Um, and some of the most prominent of which is there's not only a pro scene, there's an amateur circuit, and there is a college circuit, all of which gets coverage. Like, actual, you can watch broadcasts of those things. It's not just like, oh, it's there, but it's it gets coverage. People get scholarships to go to major universities for playing League of Legends, right? You can get you know, six-figure, seven-figure um, income if you become a pro player. You can become a very prominent content creator and, you, you know, earn six figures if you become really big in League of Legends. If you can get to Challenger and make a name for yourself, you can make a lot of money. So people, you know, take the game very cons seriously because of that, because there's a lot of stakes. There's a lot of potential, like, major benefits if you can do very well at this game, okay? Versus... Um, well, there are some other factors. So let's cover the other factors too, and then we'll talk about, you know, is this unique to League or is it in other games as well? Okay, another thing is it's a really complex game. You know, there are over 150 champions. I don't know the exact number. There might even be 160 at this point. 160 champions with at least four abilities each. You know, some of them will have upwards of seven abilities each if you think of like Elise or Jace in their multiple forms. Um,. And then you have all of the items that are possible to get. And then you have all of the runes that are possible to get. Then you have all of the team comps that are possible to have. So how many different permutations of 10 champions can you have in a game uh, when there's 160 choices? Each one's a unique pick. And you also factor in like banning um, and items and all of that. It just makes it an extremely complex and difficult to master game because there's just so many variables constantly at play. On top of that, League is getting updates all the time, right? It's like every two weeks there are substantial updates, right? Now that doesn't shake everything out of the meta, but it certainly does change things around, you know, and that is different from some other games. There are some games that will go months, sometimes even years without substantial updates. So that really lowers the complexity of understanding the game if it remains the same for a long period of time. I remember back in the day with StarCraft 1, I mean, there would be years and years without a patch <laughs> for that game back in the day, a balance patch. Stuff would be in the same state for a long time. And it was a competitive game, but people, like, it was a lot easier to identify, I think, what people were messing up on with that. It's like, okay, everyone understands exactly how much damage a Hydralis does, everyone understands exactly how much damage a Zealot does. People are very familiar with a lot of the, you know, theories on how to win different matchups on different maps and things like that because a lot of the variables were constant for a long period of time. So that sounds kind of counterintuitive, but League has variable variables, right? Like you have a lot of stuff that goes into the game that you have to think about, but then those are always changing themselves um, and it really shakes things up constantly. So League is really complex. It's really competitive. It's a team-oriented game. So um, this invites opportunities to blame other people, right? Because you have to function as a unit. Unlike something like StarCraft, which is single player, and it's always your fault if you lose. I mean, I guess you can blame, like, the balance of the game, but you can't blame anybody else, like any specific people. Versus in a team game, there's always ways that you can blame your teammates, right? You can say, oh, well, this person had a bad KDA, this person got caught in a really stupid situation at the end of the game. This person's playing an off-meta pick. This person had a really stupid build. <clears throat> this person had a bad mental attitude. Um, whatever it is, there are millions of different ways that you can blame your teammates and avoid responsibility for some of your own shortcomings in the game. And you have to learn how to play around that. I mean, that's a huge thing, too. Is like It's not enough just to win your lane. It's not enough to have a good KDA. It's not enough to do any one thing. You have to help your teammates um, win the game, right? And so that that's just that adds into the complexity there as well, right? Because it's a team game, and you have to not only win your lane, you know, do all the tasks you're supposed to do, but you have to help your teammates win all of their stuff too. That's what it means to carry. You have to outperform everyone else in the team and help weak teammates overcome that and win the game. You just have to win 
with weak people on your team. That's just how it is. If you want all strong people on your team, then you can play something like Flex or Clash or whatever, and that's a whole different beast because the enemy team is also going to have all strong people on their team. But that is another thing that can make people toxic is because it's easier for them to avoid personal responsibility <clears throat> because it's a team game rather than a single player game. Okay, anonymous. So not only is it a team game, <clears throat> but most of the time the people that you're playing with are relatively anonymous. You don't know who they are. They don't know who you are, right? You're just another person, you know, behind a computer screen. A lot of times they don't even think of you as people. They just think of you as just, um, I don't know, just stupid things that are in the way of them climbing, right? And so it's anonymous. It's very detached. There's not even voice in League unless pe it's people in your own, um, in your own pre-made lobby. And so that means it's just really easy to dehumanize other people, to just forget that it's an actual other person on the other end of the screen trying to play, trying to win most of the time, who has the same, um, you know, the same concerns that you might have, the same goals that you might have, <clears throat> and things like that. So when it's anonymous, team-oriented, people can displace blame, all of that is going to create a potentially toxic environment. And the final thing is unrealistic expectations. You know, a lot of the content that's out there and um, a lot of the other sort of streamers and content creators create this illusion that if you just somehow master these couple of things, <clears throat> then you can go from silver to challenger, right? Like, here are all these tips to get better at the game and, you know, here's all this other stuff. Well, the thing is, like, other people are also watching that stuff. Other people are also improving over time. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit, the requisite improvement in the next section. But... People just have this unrealistic expectation that you can just climb all the time, and if you're not climbing, the game's dumb, or it's rigged, or imbalanced, or whatever, when the fact is, it's just really hard to climb, because everyone else is always improving, you're improving, but are you improving enough to like surpass other people as they're also going up, right? So it's always like a moving target. What does it actually mean to get to diamond? What does it actually mean to get to platinum, right? It's always going up and up and up. It's harder and harder and harder every year to move up because the general player base gets better every year. Lots of people stay around for a long period of time. And, you know, more and more people are watching content that is aimed at helping them improve. So people are just really unrealistic. And part of this also gets into smurfing, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. But you, sometimes you'll see content creators do, you know, these unranked to challenger accounts and they'll have like a 90% win rate and so people will think oh well Tarzan you know went through silver and gold with a 90% win rate therefore I should be able to do it and then if you can't do it then all of a sudden it's oh well all my teammates are just flaming and they're stupid and you know all this other stuff right and you're thinking I could have done it if I had good teammates right it's like well Tarzan did it without good teammates these other people did it without good teammates most of the time right but the thing is they're way better right they're playing against people that they are better than if you're just naturally in silver <clears throat> you're not going to have a 90 percent win rate going up because you're not better than everyone else yet right and so people just have this unrealistic expectation that you should be able to always go up you know uh bottom left to upper right right like you should just go straight up and if you don't then something's wrong with the game okay so I think that leads to why people are toxic. Just competitive, complex, team-oriented game with uh, playing with anonymous people and people have unrealistic expectations. They aren't um, truthful about their own abilities and what they need to do to improve. They would rather just blame other people. That leads to toxicity. I think this does exist in other games that also have these qualities, right? So if you go to something like Dota 2, it's very similar. I don't think they get as many game updates, so it may not be quite as complex. I'm not 100% about that. It depends on how you're defining complexity. <clears throat> but it's very similar. You know, something like Fortnite is going to be a little different, though, because it is team-oriented in the, a very loose sense. I guess it depends. I'm not an expert on Fortnite. But I think that the expectations are much lower. It's much more of a for-fun environment, battle royale, stuff like that. So Fortnite's probably not as toxic. You know, something like World of Warcraft... If you're running, I guess, like random dungeons or something like that, you know, maybe it can be toxic. But in general, in a lot of places, you're going to know the people. So there's not going to be that anonymous if you're like in a guild working on raids and stuff like that. So it is team oriented, but it's also not as competitive unless you're going for world firsts. So, you know, things like, um, you know, World of Warcraft, things like um, 
Fortnite are probably going to be a little bit less toxic, depending on your situation. I don't know about CSGO or um, Call of Duty or anything like that, but if they meet these criteria, I'll guarantee you there's probably going to be toxicity. Okay. So does ranked work, is ranked broken? And this kind of fits into sort of the toxicity as well here. Um, let, let, me, let me go to, yeah, well, we'll do this first. Let's talk about does ranked work. And my argument is gonna be that it does work, but a lot of toxicity stems from people believing that ranked is not working and so that makes them lash out and be toxic towards other people. So we'll talk about defining toxicity here in a second. Let's talk about does rank work as intended most of the time. And I think the answer is yes. Remember the goal is not to get everyone in Challenger. The goal is to give people a 50% win rate. And I would argue that the vast, vast majority of people, if you look at them and their overall win rates on their accounts, if they have like 200 plus games, are going to be pretty close to 50%, between like 48 and 52% most of the time for people that are naturally near their ELO. There are gonna be some differences, especially near the edges. You're gonna find a lot of challengers are gonna be between like 55 and 60%. And you might find some iron players who are gonna be between like maybe 45 and 50%, maybe even as low as 40%. But <clears throat> that's because those like the communities are so small and like the iron four and the challenger community that they're always gonna be mismatched games. So challengers are always gonna be or are often gonna be matched down against masters players and sometimes even diamond players, so they're effectively like smurfing by default because there just aren't enough people that are like that high ranked, that are that skilled. Um, so it's gonna have to match them lower. There is no other option unless you want like two hour queue times. I mean, there's only, um, depending on your region, 100 to 200 people <clears throat> in Challenger and you need 10 of them for a game of League of Legends. So at most, if there's 200 people on, you're gonna need the max you could have if every single challenger on is at the exact same time, queuing at the exact same time, you could have 20 games going. And that's it, right? So a lot of times, you know, that's just unrealistic. Um, so there's just gonna be matched with lower ranked people. And then in Iron 4, you're gonna get matched up because there aren't as many Iron 4 people. And I've got the rank distribution here. You know, challenger is an actual number. It's usually 100 to 200 flat people. But even in Master and Grandmaster, it's like a third of a percent there are so few people there. Um, and then in Iron 4, you know, there's less than 1% as well. There's 0.39, about a third of a percent. So Iron 4 people are going to regularly get matched up against, like, high iron or, you know, bronze people. And then challengers are going to get matched down against masters or diamond people. And so they're going to have, you know, win rates that are a little off. <clears throat> but in general, most people are going to be about a 50% win rate in the general population. And that's the goal. It wants to give you a fairly matched game. How statistically can you define a fairly matched game? You get people to 50% win rate. If they're winning and losing 50%, those are competitive games. Okay. Just talked about the ELO distribution. So what's the problem then? If most people are at a 50% win rate, why are people always mad? Why are people always toxic? That should be the goal is that you win about half your games, you lose half your games so that it's competitive for everybody, right? If everybody had a 55% win rate, then it wouldn't make any sense. It'd be impossible because somebody, you know, if somebody has a 55% win rate, there has to be somebody else with a 45% win rate, you know, like just very loosely. Um, it has to average out um, if it's a competitive game, right? Unless you're just inflating everyone's ego. If everyone has a 55% win rate, then it would just be how many games do you play and if you play enough games, then eventually you get to Challenger, which would kind of defeat the whole purpose of the competitive nature of the game, right? Um, because despite contrary belief, um, despite popular belief, um, you don't necessarily climb if you play more games. Like you'll see people type this, oh, this guy's got a thousand games in gold, he's bad or whatever, you know, and this other person has like 200 games. It's like, buddy look if you played a thousand games you'd probably still be in gold as well <laughs> okay i mean there there's this there's a correlation between playing a lot and doing well in the game but playing a lot does not necessarily mean you're going to do well just like anything else that's going to be highly competitive highly skill based you can go out and play basketball every single day 
for 10 hours a day, pick up games at the YMCA, you're probably not going pro in the NBA, right? I mean, you could sit there and write every single day, 12 hours a day, write novels, just crank out as much writing as you possibly humanly can. You're probably not going to be a best-selling author, right? You're not going to write the next Harry Potter or whatever. You're not going to be a millionaire off of it. Um, because sometimes, I mean, there's just a certain level of skill that's required to do it. And, you know, some people can get it and some people can't. I do think that there are ways to improve um, and people can move up over time, but you have to actively work at it. If you're just making the same mistakes over and over again for a thousand games, you're not learning anything, you're not going to move up. Versus someone in a smaller period of time, you can see some people that are like up in Challenger with, you know, 300 games or less. Right? Um, so if you look at like leaderboards here, you know, Sven right now um, has like 350 games, number one person in Challenger. Right? And then you've got this person, less than 200 games, Sequest. This person, um, less than 400. This person has 600. Right? Now this is Sven again. Well, I mean, but you can see kind of the difference there. You know, this one has almost twice as many games as this one, but this one's ranked higher because he's just performed better on that one. Maybe he only duos with his uh, pro player um, with Vulcan on this account. I know that Vulcan almost exclusively only duos. We'll talk about duoing here in a second. <clears throat> but you don't have to play a million games. Like, there are very few challenger players up here that you see that have, you know, a thousand games. There are some, but not many of them, right? And yes, a lot of them do have Smurfs. They do have multiple accounts, so they may play thousands of games. But I'm just saying that, you know, you don't have to play thousands of games in order to climb the system's not rigged like that you don't always you don't gain a benefit from playing a ton of games unless you're learning and improving over those games um so you know the elo distribution is always going to be based on skill now why does it feel rigged then why does it feel bad well the reason that it feels bad a large part of it is negative bias we have a tendency to remember things that are negative a lot more than we remember things that are positive right you're going to remember you know, that person walking down the street that was really rude to you for no reason, more than you're going to remember just everyday people being nice to you, right? And, it, you know, you might just walk through a neighborhood, right? And there might be one person that's rude to you in that whole neighborhood. Um, and maybe the other, you know, 99% are very pleasant, very chill, very cool people in that neighborhood. But you're going to think that neighborhood's terrible. You're going to think everyone's rude everyone sucks in that neighborhood just because of that one person right you're gonna have that sample bias and it's kind of it's a similar thing in League of Legends if you actually go through and look at all of your games and just think about how many people were actually like overtly negative to you in your games just go back and look at all the people honestly you're probably not even gonna remember who most of those people are in a lot of your games you may not remember anything that happened in those games but the people you do remember, if you go look, are going to be the negative people, right? You're going to remember that Yasuo that went 0-10 in your games. Oh, that guy, he was feeding hard in my games. <clears throat> but you're not going to remember all the other people a lot of times. And so we just tend to remember the negative people. Also, we don't have access to or remember negative things on the enemy team. So we're not going to really think about the person who was feeding on the enemy team, right? That person who went 0-10 on the enemy team, you're not even going to think about it. You're just going to think oh, well, this Yasuo on my team was 0-10. Um, but you look at the enemy team, they may have had an 0-9 Jax or something, but you just didn't even notice it because you were so fixated, you know, on that negative emotion on your team. So that's a huge part of it is that we just don't remember when we win, um, you know, and we don't remember when we get carried as well, right? And that's going to fit into kind of the Dunning-Kruger here in a second. But we're not going to remember the time that we kind of fed. We went 0-7 in a game, and then there was a Diana on our team that went like 15-1, and and we won the game anyways. We're just thinking, okay, we win. All right, next game. We weren't thinking, oh, we deserve to lose that game. But we didn't. We got carried. Right? Um, and so we just always remember when it's people that are talking bad to us or people that are having you know a bad game on our team and we forget all the other positive people we forget when we have a bad game and someone else carries us we forget negativity on the enemy team 
we don't have access to a lot of that. We don't know what they're saying in chat. And often we don't even think about the people that are feeding on their team, the 0 and 10 person, unless they're like literally running it down middle. But even then, you know, the next day we're just gonna brush it off. We're not even gonna remember it. But we might remember the one guy who personally insulted us or something like that, like two weeks later, right? And so we just have, and that's, like I said, it's with a lot of things in life. We just tend to remember negative stuff a lot more than positive stuff. And that's a lot of why a lot of the news is negative. You know, a lot of the news these days has become negative because that's what sells. That's what really resonates with people. Unfortunately, that's what they remember. That's why they come back. It's a whole different discussion. But that's part of it. It's just our negative bias. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is something that's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. And this is sort of... Um, it's a type of bias that's really has multiple facets to it that are interesting. So, you know, look it up on Wiki if you want to. But um, basically, this is people tend to be overconfident when they're less skilled at something because they don't understand, they don't know what they don't know, if that makes sense. So, someone um, they found a lot of times people who were mediocre at something or people who weren't that good at something. They call it incompetence. People who were really not that skilled in something tended to be more confident in their abilities, tended to think that they were a lot better than they actually were by a much larger margin than people who were skilled at something. Because the people who are skilled, it's much more likely that they're going to know what they don't know. Right, so they're gonna understand, you know, someone who's like in masters or challenge or whatever is gonna understand, oh, I just made these mistakes. Because they're gonna know how to identify mistakes and how to correct them. And so because they can see all of these mistakes they're constantly making, then they're gonna understand I have a lot to learn. There's a lot of things I can work on. And they're gonna be able to take personal responsibility for what they're doing a little bit more. Versus, you know, people in like bronze and silver almost everybody to some extent is gonna fall prey to this because we all do it kind of unconsciously without even thinking about it because we don't know. Like we don't know what we don't know a lot of times, right? Like they might be making a million different errors in silver, but they're not gonna see them as errors that they can take responsibility for, right? They're gonna see it as you know something that their teammates did, something they messed up. And a lot of times they're gonna fixate on bad like bad obvious outcomes rather than missed opportunities so they're going to fixate on the you know their jungler missing smite on baron and losing the game because of that rather than you know smaller incremental stuff over the game like okay they got a, a four kill lead bottom but they they didn't break the tower for an additional 10 minutes because they didn't apply enough pressure to the tower and so that let the enemy team farm back up that let the enemy mid laner continue to abuse their mid laner and get ahead, right? That let their top laner, you know, continue to get ahead of the other top laner. So they didn't push their advantage enough and they allowed their weaker teammates to fall further and further behind because they didn't apply enough pressure on the map. And that's the type of thing that they, a lot of people in silver and really in a lot of ELOs aren't gonna take responsibility for, right? You're responsible for everyone on the map. So if you get an advantage, if you get a lead, you have to carry. It's a proactive thing. You have to be looking for opportunities. You can't just chill and just rest on your laurels and say, ha, I'm up five kills and you know, 60 CS bot lane. If we lose, it's top lane diff, you know? It's like, no, you have to go help your top laner. You have to go like make sure everybody wins. And that's why, you know, Apdo and some of these other people that climb regularly and have really high win rates, they play macro champs. You know, Abdo is known for playing TF because then he can influence every lane. A lot of high elo players over time have played things like Talia because it can roam and influence lanes. A lot of high elo supports, you know, will play stuff that roams really well. It's debatable. Like, support is one of the roles where it gets the most different at higher elo than at lower elo, the champion pools that are um, good. But that, that's a different video. I won't, won't go down that rabbit hole. Watch my uh, support tier list if you want to know more about that. But anyways... So this is a major problem, is that a lot of people, it's hard for them to take responsibility for the mistakes they made because they don't understand the mistakes they're making. And so they get frustrated. And it feels like ranked is unfair because they think they're doing really well. They think they're better than they actually are. But it goes a step further than that, than people being overconfident. They're overconfident because they lack the knowledge. 
and they lack the knowledge because they're overconfident. It's a vicious cycle where people don't think they need to learn anything. They don't think they need to examine themselves because they think they're better than everybody else. But statistically, if you're 50% and you've played a couple hundred games or whatever, something's not working. You have stuff to learn. Everybody has stuff to learn, but you're really not gonna climb out of that rut unless you have self-reflection and learning. But that's why ranks can feel you know, unfair is because we always think we're better than we actually are. And a lot of it is because we're ignorant to a lot of the mistakes that we're making. A lot of them aren't obvious mistakes, they're missed opportunities, which in and of themselves are mistakes, but they're not obvious. Okay, requisite improvement. This is another thing. And this is something that you see, and particularly there are people that at the high end of the curve, the people near like master and challenger that just can't get there anymore, you know, maybe they used to be a challenger player, they're falling down into master, maybe they used to be master, they're in diamond. You can see this, you can start to sense a lot of frustration in some of these content creators because it's harder and harder to climb every year. Like I mentioned earlier, people just get better. They're so, like when I first started making this channel, I was one of the only informational channels out there. There were a couple of other ones, but it certainly was not a very popular style of channel. At the time, it was just all, you know, a bunch of all caps videos for the most part. Right, just here's this crazy new Korean build and or like montages. Here's my Z like crazy montage or stream highlights, stuff like that. But there's been an explosion in the last couple of years of like educational sites. You know, you've got um, uh, Mobilytics and just Pro Guides, all of these other sites. There's just tons and tons and tons of sites out there and just other content creators that are popping up that are trying to teach people how to become better lead content creators. And there's a huge market for that. Um, so people are improving way, way more. I mean, I'm very surprised, like playing all my Smurf and Gold over the last um, couple of months, like building up to that. Um, people are just way better in Gold than they used to be in like high Platinum, honestly. Like, because I, first time I got Platinum was like in season three, uh, way back in the day. And I'll tell you, I, bear, I never even thought about wave management. You know, I never thought about getting priority and like back timings and things like that, you know. For the most part, it was just, okay, you know, like reactive stuff. Like, okay, I'm gonna get vision out. If I see something, I'm gonna try to make a play on it. Like I wasn't proactively planning stuff out, especially thinking of wave management. Even pro players at the time were not really thinking about wave management. Until level, like in season two, at the time, you know, M5 really revolutionized the pro scene by playing stuff like Shivana in the jungle, who was thought as worthless because she didn't have a lot of CC, but she, you know, could power farm really quickly and create a lot of pressure in side lanes. Um, and then you could pressure towers off of that. And people did the lane swap meta. Um, so it was really weird where people were thinking about rotations, uh, wave priority and stuff like that. It really didn't even start to crystallize and become a mainstay of like pro support play until like season three or season four. Um, so you had the best players in the world weren't even thinking about that. And now you have people like even in like, you see some in like silver and gold, people that are, you know, trying to manage waves. They're trying to freeze it outside their tower. They're trying to set up a push um, for a back timing. Now, some of the wave management is a lot more complicated. You don't see it all the time in gold, but you certainly see more of it than you used to. Um, <clears throat> so people are just improving a lot and it's kind of sad there are some challenger players and you know some of them are getting frustrated this season they're saying oh it's toxic or you can't climb in league or, you know they're just coming up with all these excuses it's like dude you're just not as good as you used to be compared to other people it's okay it happens but like you can't just sit there and be lazy and not try to improve your game and expect to stay on the top like you have to play the game especially at that level you have to constantly improve because everyone else is improving and so, like, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but, you know, they just get embarrassed. Their fans will kind of poke fun at them, like, oh, you're only Diamond this season instead of Masters or Challenger or whatever. It's like, there's a lot of pressure. We'll talk about that with Smurfing here in a second, but it's hard. It's hard to get back up there. It takes a lot of work. And it's, it you know, back in the day, you used to be able to just kind of chill. You know, you could be up at, you know, Challenger or whatever and just kind of, you know, relax and not do that much. I mean, I don't want to... I guess I'll just say, you know, this was a thing with I'm a cutie pie. I don't know if he still even plays. He might be kind of retired. Night Blue 3. Um, you know, there are some of these legacy players that at one point had been near the top of the challenger ladder, but they just haven't been able to keep up in recent years. And once again, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but 
Dyrus, I don't know if Dyrus still even plays league anymore. <clears throat> but yeah, especially some of these older legacy players, a lot of them, um, you know, you just don't see them near the top of Challenger anymore. And part of that is they, it, the game gets harder with age because your your reflexes get slower and you just, you know, you may not get in as much um, quality practice as you used to whenever you were a, um, a pro player. But anyways, you just have to constantly improve as well. And then you have the autofill. Now, this is something that, like, autofill and duoing, we'll talk about duoing here in a second, but autofill and duoing are things that do throw off ranked a little bit, right? Um, Riot says, and I have no way to statistically prove this or not, but they say that you have to have autofill. If you're letting people, like, pick roles, you have to have autofill. Now, back in the day, there wasn't an autofill because every game was autofill. You couldn't even call your roles until, I think, like, season five or six. You could not pick your roles. It was just straight up, you got in the lobby, top to bottom, and that was it. Like, nobody had a role that they were called, and, you know, you could try to call your role at the beginning. That was a, you know, a famous debate. Almost every lobby was like that. It's like, okay, is it the person who has first pick, the person who's higher up the role, or just whoever types it first, what role they want? You know, officially, it was supposed to be the higher pick. Had their choice. But... You know, that was a big deal. So basically, everybody had the potential to be auto-filled every game. But now, people are a little more spoiled. They think, oh, well, I picked, you know, I want to play mid every game, therefore I should be able to play mid every game. You know, they feel entitled to that. It's like, no, you're not guaranteed to do that. Other people want to play that role too. You're sharing this space with five other people in this game, and if someone else wants to play mid and you want to play mid, why are you more important than them? You know, everyone thinks they're special, <laughs> right? Um, but, uh, and everyone, th part of that is everyone thinks they're better than everyone else, right? Because of the Dunning Kruger. Um, but, you know, Riot says that you, like, that's necessary, or you would just have really, really long queue times. Like, I, I don't know how long, but particularly in Challenger or whatever, it, it would be impossible. But even down, they say down in like silver and gold, if you didn't have autofill. It would be huge queue times. Now you might think, okay, well, why can't people just have like a checkbox where you say, I'll wait as long as I want for a queue, but I want to be guaranteed to get mid lane. The problem is a lot of people would do that and it would de facto slow down the queue a lot. And anyone that said, I don't want that, like I would like mid, but I want a fast queue, they're going to be auto filled every time if they do that. So eventually it's going to lead to everybody checking that box, right? That they want to wait longer. But there's a lot of people that, you know, don't, right? League of Legends already takes a long time to get into. You know, like in Fortnite, I don't know the queue times, but it's probably like less than two minutes, right? Like you queue up, I want to play a game. You know, you're playing with your friends, you're trying to get in a couple of games before work or school or whatever, and you're just like, I want to play a game. Go. And it's like probably one minute, two minutes. I don't know how long it is. I've never played Fortnite, but probably really short. You just get into a game. Boom. You're there. You're, you know, shooting out of your parachute within a few minutes. Right? In League of Legends, you're going to have to wait. Even in stuff like Silver and Gold, you're probably waiting at least a minute on the queue time. Then you get in. Then there's, uh, you know, hover the champion that you want. That's for like 30 seconds. Then there's the banning phase. That's another 30 seconds. Then each person or each like little set of picks has 30 seconds to make their pick. And then you have to load into the game after that. And then there's basically, there's some stuff that happens before two minutes, but usually there's not a lot that's happening before two minutes and you start the landing phase. So you're looking at, even in silver or gold, you're looking at a minimum five to 10 minutes before you're actually you know, farming minions in a lane, right? So that's already a really long time. So if you tack on an additional, and the, the games also last 25 to 30 minutes. So round trip, and that's if nobody dodges. If somebody dodges, you're adding on an extra five to 10 minutes each time somebody dodges. Um, so that, you know, you're looking at minimum, after all of that's done, 35 to 40 minutes from the time you press like start queue to the time the surrender screen goes off. You're probably gonna be looking at you know 35 to 40 minutes and compared once again with Fortnite, i don't know how long it is i mean some games can last as, as long as like or as short as like one minute you die boom you requeue, no problem but if you actually win i don't know how long that takes what is it 15 20 minutes i don't know but i feel like league has one of the longest requirements already for most um you know popular games in terms of 
getting into the game, completing the game, um, and moving on. So adding on an extra, you know, five or ten minutes on top of that, which gets compounded every time somebody dodges. Now, there would probably be less dodges if there wasn't an autofill, but it's just too much time, probably. So it sounds nice, everyone gets their roll, but if it's adding on, you know, three to five minutes at least, even in Silver and in Challenger, probably add on an extra 30 minutes. It's just you couldn't do it in Challenger. But even at lower elos, I think that's just, even though it doesn't sound like a lot, that's probably just too much for a lot of players. Would I personally be willing to wait a little bit longer, you know, to guarantee that I get my roll? Well, it doesn't matter because I play support, so, you know, I get my roll like 99% of the time anyways. But if I played mid, maybe, maybe. But I think there's also something to be said for being able to play different champions in different roles as well. And we'll talk about that here in a minute with kind of the one-trick problem in League. But let's go ahead and move on. Okay, because I do want to try to keep this under an hour if I can. So, yeah, all of these um, mean that ranked works but potentially has some problems, it perceived problems because of autofill and requisite um, improvement and the Dunning-Kruger effect and negative bias. But it does bring most people to a 50% win rate and that's the ultimate goal of a fair game is you have a 50-50 whenever you enter the game. Okay, so let's talk about toxicity in general, um, some solutions and how does this stuff like with ranked, how does that fit into this concept of toxicity? So toxicity, I think should be classified very loosely as okay I'll get them in just a minute for you okay just a couple minutes and daddy will get you some okay wow that's cool um, so it needs to be intentionally diminishing ruining whatever you want to call it the experience of other people creating a negative ex experience for other people intentionally oh wow Wow, you stretched over that chair, didn't you, Rory? That's pretty good. Yeah, you gonna build with your blocks? You gonna build some stuff? Um, so, but uh, obvious, it's not that easy though. That's the simple definition, but then the main things that I wanna talk about in terms of like what's Riot limited to and what are some possible solutions here are intent versus coincidence. So does someone intend to feed in your game or is it just incidental that they happen to die a lot in your game, right? And it's really hard to draw the line on that, um, especially with some of these win traders and very insidious people who just happen to miss a key skill shot in a team fight or they happen to position a little poorly and get caught out at a key moment. Um, so how do you differentiate bad play from like intentionally throwing the game because if it's just bad play if you accidentally throw the game I don't think that's toxic that's just bad play and they shouldn't ban people for that because everyone has bad games sometimes wow look at that oh is it gonna go on the ramp okay let's see it oh whoa oh my gosh that's awesome Rory good job and then another one that comes down to is, and this is one that's always really heated. Good job, be gentle with Sadie, okay? She's old. And she's so cute. She's so cute, isn't she? Yeah. yeah she's got a tail back there. She's got a tail back there, yeah. There she goes. Um, and she's black. Sadie's black, that's right. Mm -hmm. oh, is personal freedom versus social obligation. And this is everywhere in society, but in League of Legends, it comes off that way too where do you ha should you have the freedom to do anything that you want anytime that you want in League of Legends even though you're sharing the space with other people what are your obligations to those other people when you're sharing that space okay and that's what it kind of gets into toxicity should you be able to say anything that you want should you be able to pick anything that you want and use any kind of strategy that you want no matter how ridiculous it might be in terms of lowering your chances to win the game and you know this comes up a lot we'll talk about that in terms of limitations here in a second but i think most people agree there should be some sort of limitation on that so that you can't ruin the gameplay for other people but at the same time you shouldn't have to conform to like strict social standards you should have some freedom to do stuff that you want to do even if it's unusual and enjoy the game so how do you draw that line um you know, is it okay to go uh, death cap Z? You know, that's something that like Boy Boy mentioned before, like full AP Z in his games. Um, even though we know that somebody is aware that that's a bad pick, right? If they're trying to win, if they're trying that out, 
Um, should that be something that's punishable? Uh, so anyways, we'll talk about that here in a second. But I think these are the two biggest things, intent versus coincidence, and then personal freedom versus social obligation. So let's talk about some of the limitations that Riot has, and then we'll talk more specifically about some solutions that might be possible given these limitations. Okay. Number one, um, Riot gets millions of reports every day. So that's one thing that you have to understand. Millions and millions of reports. There are 100 million people that play this game. I don't. I think it was like at least, log in at least once a month. I don't remember if that's different accounts or unique people or if there's any way they can even track that. But either way, whatever the number is, it's millions and millions of people. And I would say that in every game of 10 people, there's probably at least one report that somebody's going to send out on one team. In most of my games, that's what it feels like. There's one report, right? Um, and sometimes there's more than that. And the vast, vast majority of the time when I see people saying to report stuff, it is vindictive, right? It's somebody was arguing in chat about something. You know, the jungler didn't gank for them or, you know, mid lane went 0-3 and, and somebody pinged them and they got in an argument about it or what? it's just like petty stuff that really didn't influence the outcome of the game that much most of the time. Like, most people were trying to win, just stuff got a little heated, um, and somebody is just wants to have some control over it. You know, they don't understand. They have the Dunning-Kruger going on. They don't understand what mistake they made. They think it's just their stupid teammates, and so they think, if I report this guy, if he gets banned, that's one less idiot in silver, and then I'm going to have a better chance to climb. I think that's what a lot of people think. And so they'll just report people for anything, basically, because they just want to take their frustration out. And so Riot, I would say that probably 80%, at least, of these reports are going to be false reports in the sense that they aren't doing something that is, you know, really diminishing experiences in a significant way and um, is leading to, um, you know, unnecessary losses. There are some things. Like, some reports do work, but you have to understand, most reports are a waste of time from Riot. It's just people venting or people frustrated and reporting stuff that really shouldn't be punished that much, honestly. And so, that takes a lot of manpower, right? If you were having, like, like everyone's like, oh, why don't Riot just review all this stuff? It's like, they would have to, I mean, how many people, if it's like, there's 5 million reports every day, if... Four million of those are like ridiculous reports that are just false, that are just little baby rage reports. Um, how many people would it take to go through that? If each report, you know, if they're giving it a good read and thinking about it carefully, maybe 10 minutes on a report. I don't know the math, but if you have someone, if you were to pay someone eight hours a day, I mean, I guess, like, let's see, I can do the math here. So let's say you pay somebody, their only job is to go through reports eight hours a day. They can do, let's just say five an hour, right? So maybe 10 minutes each with a 10 minute break per hour just to kind of do whatever, reset, take a lunch on average or whatever. So they do five per hour. That's 40 reports they could go through um, in a day, right? And so how many... So 40 reports in a day. So if you get uh, 5 million reports, 5 million reports, one person could do 40 in a day. That means you would need to hire a staff of 125,000 people to go through that every single day to cover all of those reports. If you pay these people 25,000 a year, You would have to pay $3.1 billion just to try to read through this toxicity stuff. So if you hired full-time people, literally their only job is to go through these reports. They do them in a reasonably fast manner, fast but fair. They're actually reading the log reports. You know, they're actually looking at match histories. They're doing more than just looking at chat, right? They're actually trying to contextualize it to understand the situation to go through all of these, you know, doing 10 per, you know, one per 10 minutes on average with a small break, $3.1 billion. 
even if you said that, okay they can do it in five minutes they just skim the chat log whatever you're still talking over a billion dollars 1.5 billion dollars like riot does have money they don't have that much money guys they can't drop an extra 3.1 billion on that and the thing is that wouldn't even clean up most of the stuff we'll talk about that here in a second um what some of these li limitations are and what some of the solutions are but that's just an unreasonable amount of money they can't spend 3.1 billion dollars trying to police chat it's just ridiculous. Um, <clears throat> now, some people have said, oh, well, what if I just tweet Riot? You know, like, I, they're just going to tell me to go through a support ticket. What if I just send them this image that, like, guarantees, oh, this person was toxic or whatever? It's like stuff can be doctored. This is 2020, right? Like, there are some really good photo editors and video editors out there. And if Riot allowed that, I saw it was someone like that who tweeted something or other. It's like, why doesn't Riot do anything about this if they tweeted them some video evidence? It's like there are people that are so good at doctoring videos out there that they could easily, you know, doctor up a chat log and something that looks like a lead client, or they could like clip together some, you know, different stuff. Or, you know, it could be taken out of context, just like a normal report could be taken out of context. So some of these, I think, content creators feel entitled and say, oh, well, they should listen to me. Like, that, you know, if I tweet them this or that, it's like, why? why? I mean, I don't know. That That's another thing that kind of gets into it is content creators feel like they should have, like, special priority over stuff. And there may be an argument that they should, but people were really mad when Night Blue 3 did that, when he um, got the Teemo support guy, Nubrak, who went middle, when he got a rioter to take action on that and punish that guy, everyone was like up in arms. Oh my God, he went directly to riot. He bypassed the system. You know, people would just bring out their pitchforks and things like that. So, you know, people just get pissed about that if someone bypasses the system. Because everyone else is, oh, well, why can't I talk to my own personal rioter to get stuff done? Um, which content creators, I think, should get some special consideration if they're really big, just because so many people see their games. But... Anyways, I don't want to go too far into that, um, just because we are starting to run a little bit shorter on time. But anyways, my main point here is just that millions of reports every day, it is unreasonable to have them sort of a rioter personally go through every report and give it a fair read. Okay, so that means they have to use stuff like um, chat recognition, right? So looking for certain words, looking for certain patterns. They, you know, they have a lever buster. If someone doesn't move for a certain amount of time, they get an X. Or if they're out of the game for a certain amount of time, they get lever bustered. So they have to try to use these automated AI systems to help them skim through all of that because they just can't do it, right? And um, part of that leads to a lack of clarity about the punishment system that people get frustrated about. Like they wonder why certain players don't get punished and why other players do get punished they're like why does this prominent streamer you know one of them why do they you know act really negative towards some of their people um people in their games and they don't get punished but then you know another prominent streamer does get punished for certain things and some of it's just going to depend on the volume like they're probably going to look at them just like they would look at everybody else right and this is prominent right now with like hi Right where we see this report in this chat log from High, and everyone's like, "Oh my God, that's not that bad. Why did High get chat restricted?" Well, we don't know for sure that that's the only thing that happened with him. We don't know that he hasn't been reported in a bunch of other stuff. Like we just don't have the metrics on those things, right? And then they'll say, "Well, why is Tyler One not like chat restricted? Does he get special treatment?" I mean, maybe he does. I don't know, but. The thing is, like these automated systems lack clarity, so people don't know for sure why certain people are getting punished and why certain people aren't. They give you a little report that tells you stuff, but there are lots of um, variables in there that you just can't really ever be sure about. Um, so that leads to frustration. However, you also can't um, fully tell everybody how the system actually works, because if you did that, there are gonna be people that exploit the system. Right, if you know, Riot says something to the effect of, okay, if you get 100 reports in a one week period, you will get a two week ban. You know, there's going to be people out there that are going to act toxic and they're going to say, okay, well, I'm just going to get 80 reports this week and then I'm going to chill until Sunday because I know it's going to reset Sunday at 2 a.m. and then I can get 80 more reports after that. Or there's going to be somebody who's like, okay, 
it says that if you stand in the fountain for two minutes and 30 seconds, then you're going to get flagged as AFK and you're going to get lever busted. But what if I just stand right outside of the fountain, right? What if I stand one pixel outside of the fountain? Or what if I just walk around the jungle, you know? Or, you know, it says that I could get flagged for, you know, this or that or, or whatever, right? Um, so if you tell people exactly what your criteria is for these AI systems, people are going to exploit it because the AI and these algorithms can't interpret that. It takes humans to interpret other scummy human behavior a lot of times, other complex behavior like, um, you know, uh, inting and like, or I guess like socially messing with people and things like that. Like, you know, someone could go around and instead of stealing the buffs or instead of like stealing the CS in lane, they could just make it really hard for the ADC to CS, right? Like they could not quite get the last hit, but almost get the last hit if they knew that the system was looking at how many uh, CS a support got, for example. I'm not even saying they would do something like that, but how much CS like a support is taking from their ADC. Like y'all know people, people, you know, some of these, and it, once again, it's a very small amount of people that are very visible because of our negative bias. But these kinds of people, they're gonna find loopholes. They're gonna find ways around it. They're gonna find ways to game the system. So that's the thing is they can't say exactly what they do because then that will encourage exploitation. But the fact that they can't say it leads to more frustration because people don't understand why some people are getting um, punished and other people aren't. It just seems inconsistent, but it has to it, it has to have a level of opaqueness to it for it to actually work, for it to actually catch people. Um, you know, another thing is inconsistent community complaints. You know, the league community, and it looks like we're gonna go a little bit over an hour, but whatever. Um, the league community wants different things, right? So if we look at the new Brack thing, the Teemo support or like the Singe support from a while back, everyone or a lot of people, especially lower ELO people, defended this behavior. They said, oh, well, Teemo should be able to do whatever he wants. If he wants to lock in Teemo support and then go mid lane all game, that's his prerogative. He can do it. It's a game. It should be for fun. You know, LOL, why are people getting mad about this? Well, the thing is, it's competitive, and it actually means something. This is something that sometimes people would, um, you know, say to me on stream sometimes. Be like, well, you know, why are you frustrated sometimes at some of these games? Or why do you care, like, if someone, like, about the meta or about winning games? It's just a game. Just have fun with it. Well, first of all, it's not fun to lose a lot for a lot of people. Um, it, you know, that's subjective. But second of all, like for a lot of people, especially these streamers and high-end content creators, this is their job. This is money, right, for them. And so if they end up losing because of this kind of stuff, it costs them money. If Voiboy Boy or somebody else is not in Challenger, you know, if they're only in Diamond, they are going to catch it from their team or from their fans, right? People are going to be, you know, talking trash about them. There might be people that unsub eventually because they say, He's washed up. He's just not as good as he used to be. We're going to unsub him. We're going to go watch somebody else. You know, fan bases can be very fickle about that stuff. I'm not saying that always happens, but it could. And, um, you know, this could also ruin the experience for some people. Number one, because he may not get to have a legitimate game. So if you get something like that on your team, and I'm not going to come down and say, I personally think that there should have been a punishment. I'll just say it. I know it's controversial. But I just want to talk about from the content creator's perspective why people, why some of these challengers were frustrated with Nubrak because it's not just for fun, it's their livelihood, it's their money, right? And so, um, for instance, let's say that you're watching like Shifter or some other mid laner or whatever and, um, you know, you get a game like with Nubrak in it and he's just going to sit middle with Teemo well, you already, if this is like a master game or a challenger game or something, you already just waited, like we talked about earlier, if you're watching the stream, you just waited like 20 minutes to get this game, at least a 10 minute queue timer and then pick ban and all this other stuff. You just waited 20 minutes and now you don't get to watch your favorite streamer actually play legitimate League of Legends, right? You wanted to watch his one-on-one -on -one matchup. You wanted to watch Syndra into Talon because... You know, that's an exciting matchup. You enjoy watching it. Maybe you're trying to learn. Maybe you always lose that matchup as Syndra, 
against Talon and you want to learn how to play it better. So you're watching Shifter. You want to see how does he deal with that? How can I learn from this? How can I become a better player? Right? Um, now you don't get that. Now you've just got this guy in the middle that's throwing that off. It's not the same matchup at all. The bot lane's probably going to lose. It just creates this chaos that's just not the standard game. Right? It's like if you just showed up and you're wanting to watch a basketball game or whatever... And, you know, one of the players just decided to go and, like, stand in the corner of the court and just not move for the whole game. It's like, yeah, it's still five on five, but it dramatically changes the game because it's creating a four on five. I mean, it's not that extreme, but it's like if someone's doing something that's just, like, super erratic, maybe it's some next level stuff. Maybe the guy, like, never leaves half court. He just steps on one side of the half court and then goes to the other side of half court. I mean, can you imagine, like, how ridiculous that would be and, like, how outraged fans and everyone would be? Um, you know, would people like come up and say, oh, he should be able to do that. Uh, you know, right. He should be able to stand at half court the whole time. Um, because that way he's always ready. If they throw a, you know, a backdoor pass to him, he's always going to be ready. He's in the best position possible for that outlet pass to get an easy, you know, layup. If the enemy team or if you um, if his team gets a rebound, he's ready for that outlet pass. I mean, even if you have a strategy for it, it still is going to diminish, like, the experience for a lot of your team, right? Um, so, anyways, that that's the thing, is that it's frustrating for viewers. It's frustrating for content creators. It's going to put them in a bad mood. People don't like it when content creators are in a bad mood, right? And so, it just it creates a lot of problems. So, that's why a lot of, like, challenger and master level players who actually experienced that were frustrated by it. But then you had people in, like, silver and bronze defending that kind of behavior because... They don't see it from that business aspect, right? They don't see it from that creator aspect a lot of times. Um, they just see it as, oh, this person's just YOLOing and doing something for fun. It's a game. Just have fun with it. It's like, yeah, it is a game. Just like, you know, playing basketball. If you want to do that kind of stuff with your buddy, you know, you're just playing pickup games of fives and you want to do some experimental stuff like that, like someone standing half court or someone like, you know, always standing in the corner, like, and only shoots threes over the backboard from the corner or something like that. If everyone's cool with it and you're just playing with your friends, sure, no problem. But it's like, once you take it up to a certain level, it becomes increasingly problematic. But anyways, my main point there is not necessarily to dredge that up and say this or that, but it's just to show that people are inconsistent about that. Because um, people were sort of on the Nubrak side for a while there saying, oh, well, people should have their freedom. They should be able to play whatever they want, whenever they want. And then you had the Voy Boy situation. I guess that was a few weeks ago where he was complaining that a lot of people were not taking the game seriously and were trolling around in his games. And he pointed out, like, you've got, like, APZ and some other, like, non-traditional stuff going on in your games. And he was saying that it was ruining the games. And a lot of people were taking Boy Boy side saying, oh yeah, League's toxic. All these people are playing weird off meta stuff. They don't know how to play. When it's like last year, they were complaining that, you know, people were treating Nubrak unfairly because, or, or Singe support a couple of years before that because they were playing off meta stuff. So Riot just doesn't know. It's like, okay, do we crack down and try to enforce the meta a little bit more? Or do we let people experiment and just YOLO queue and it fixes itself, right? Nubrak loses games. He drops down in ELO. Naturally, um, he will stop doing that eventually if he wants to win games. If he wants to lose games, that's his prerogative. Everybody's going to get a turn with him. And then if you're a good player, you'll win all the rest of your games and climb. So, you know, does Riot take that stance? Just people who do goofy stuff are going to fall down. And, you know, everybody just has to deal with that every now and then just weird stuff and you know 10 to 20 percent of your games or do they try to crack down on it so we'll talk about my solutions to that here in a second but that is that is a major problem is that riot isn't sure what to do because the community is inconsistent and just complains about everything okay another thing is players will select suboptimal champs so this is kind of what i was talking about a second ago is that it doesn't really matter like what riot does at the end of the day in terms of a certain level of unfair games are just going to happen because people are going to pick suboptimal champs they're going to pick weird stuff that's not that good or first time things they don't have experience on and it's really hard to legislate that right so you could say something they could implement a rule where you can't play something in ranked until you've played at least at least 10 games in normal that would probably be okay but people could still be bad 
Okay, we're almost just a couple more minutes, okay? And then I'll get it for you. Um, Can you play with your cars for a few minutes and then we'll get it? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Dad, um, wow, is it going to go down the ramp? Let's see it. So, that's the thing is you just can't stop people yeah, from just good. saying, you know what, I feel like playing Yasuo this game. I mean, I've never played him before, but I just watched a cool montage. I want to try Yasuo out this game. Or I just got auto-filled Wii Sin. Um, I'm at, good job, Rory. You going? Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Wow. I want to. Good job. That's cool, Rory. Um, or they might just say, you know what? I'm at zero LP. I can't get demoted this game. I just got auto-filled jungle. Let's just play some Lee Sin. What? What is it? I actually don't know why she's mad. What is it, Rory? What? Mommy, we love it. Don't worry. I can't get you chocolate chips. Okay, Daddy will get them for you here in a second. Oh, she needs a hug. Oh. I'll get them for you here in a second, Rory. Okay. You want to build? You want to build some blocks or something for a few minutes, and I'll get them. Um, Daddy's almost done. Um, but yeah, you, you just—it's so hard to stop people from doing that, or just like something that they're—you know—they have a forty percent win rate on. Maybe they've played two hundred games as a collie. They love a collie. They're a one-trick a collie, but they've got a forty-six percent win rate. You know, and by God, they're just gonna play a collie. You know, so you just can't stop people from playing stuff that they're just not going to do well on. Or it's extremely difficult to stop that in all circumstances. So, you know, it doesn't matter. And they could try their hardest to win, you know, and still go 0 and 8. And it's like, you just can't, it, it's so hard to punish. I mean, you can't punish people for just having bad games a lot of times that are like legitimately trying, even if they have bad games a lot on those champs. Or I feel like there would be a massive backlash if you did that. So that's just something that's very limit. Riot, Riot can't do that. Like, they can put limits on, you know, like I said, you have to have so many mastery points on a champ or you have to play it ten times before you can play it in ranked. Or maybe, like, new releases or new champs can't be played in ranked for a week or something. People wouldn't like that very much, and I just don't think it would really fix the problem. People are still going to play stuff they're not good on. Um, or stuff that's really far out of the meta that's just weird that they want to do. It's like, by God, they're just going to play Ash support or, you know, something like that. They just love it. They just want to play it. Um, whatever it is, people are just going to do it. Um, I don't know what... Oh. Um, Smurfs? I don't remember what I was going to say there, honestly. Well... We'll just go over that. And then you also have the Dunning-Kruger, where no matter what Riot does, p there are just going to be people that are like underperforming, that are just at the average, that are silver or whatever, and you know, no matter what happens, they're just going to refuse to take responsibility for their games, they're just going to blame teammates, and they're just going to think that ranked is bad. That's it. You know, even if you somehow could fix all of these other things people would st because it's a competitive game by nature not everybody can get to challenger it is limited there are certain percentages for each bracket that's the distribution curve that's not going to change because it's a competitive nature and this is just how an elo system works now i do think it would be nice if it distributed higher so if every if like gold was the average i think it because one thing that does feel a little ridiculous is that the vast majority of players, you know, 75% of players hang out in three divisions versus there's one, two, three, four, five, six different divisions and designations for the top 25%. Hell, for the top like 2%, there's one, two, three, four different divisions for 2%. It's like half, almost half of the divisions are for 2% of players. So I think it's a labeling problem too that is a big issue but the problem is as you go up the skill gap scales tremendously high so the difference between like a diamond four and like the number one challenger is just absolutely massive like the difference there is probably higher than between like gold four and diamond four like 
it's really, really big. So that's why they have these different divisions because there are massive differences when you get up here. But there are also like pretty big differences down here. So I don't know. I just think that it's people just feel bad because they're stuck in silver and they're like, oh, that's like the third lowest division when in fact that's average. I just feel like if it was average, it should be the fourth or the fifth one. So like it should distribute to gold or um, platinum as the average and then move up from there. I think that might help a little bit. I don't think they're ever going to do that. Anyways, what are some of the solutions? Then we'll probably have to stop. I'm not going to be able to go into all of this. I'll, I'll do it as fast as I can here. This is taking longer than I thought it would. But um, Okay, number one, people should just disable chat. Riot should tell them of this feature, and they should encourage people to just disable chat a lot of times. And then they should just chat restrict instead of like banning people for doing certain things. I mean, there are certain, if someone like shows like you know, like extreme racism or um, telling people to kill themselves and things like that. You know, there should be stricter punishments for that. But if it's your standard, like, you suck, I'll fight you, your mom's fat, you know, all that kind of stuff, it, it should just be chat restriction to start with. And I think they are doing that a bit more. And they should just tell people, just mute chat, it's fine, you'll improve your life. Riot should detect AFK better, so they might work on this, but just look at gameplay patterns, and once again, they may not be able to tell people exactly what this is, but if it's something like in games that they're losing, they have like much lower presence, so they're just not near their team for a certain level of time, like maybe, you know, and I don't know how they would quantify this, but maybe they are near their teammates 20% of the time within a thousand units of a teammate, 20% of the time if they're like a jungler or something in sort of their average games and look at this you would look at this in combination with reports so if you looked at a report every you know maybe this person got three reports for being afk and then you could look at some stat that would say you know for the last 10 minutes of the game this person was not within a thousand units of an ally more than five percent of the time or something like that you could also look at their movement but the thing is like people sometimes at afk will move just a little bit like every you know minute or so they'll just touch their mouse and move a little bit like in the base or they might even go like in the jungle or something and move around a little bit but they could just look at proximity to other champs um and you know just something like that to detect afk a little bit better just look at proximity um they should detect play pattern divergences and warn. So once again, I don't know how they would do this. They'd have to do a combination of things, but if it's like, if you're you know really far behind and you get killed more solo or something like that, you get killed 75% more when there's not a teammate within a thousand units. If you're behind in a game, that would be a way for an AI system to detect, hey, you might be inting. You're running really far ahead of your team. You're making decidedly really stupid decisions more often when you're behind and in conjunction you're getting reported you know consistently by your teammates for inting okay yeah i'll get it in just a second okay rory just like one or two minutes and we'll be ready okay can you play with your cards for a second um so once again you have to look out for that because a lot of people are going to die more when they're behind that is cool. People are going to die more when they're behind. They're going to be tilted. They're going to be making mistakes. So you'd have to look at it as a package of a whole bunch of other things. But they should look at something like proximity, play patterns, how close you are to the team, how often you're dying. Are you selling items more often? Are you, um, I don't know if you could look at like buying weird items. Obviously, you look at chat. But some people, some savvy AFKers know that if you don't type anything in chat and you just move around a little bit, you're probably not going to get flagged. So once again, they can't tell people exactly what they're doing. So we'll never know if they actually do this because they don't want people to exploit the system. But they should do more stuff like that, and that would be good. Um, and if they were going to actually ban somebody, it would need a review by a rioter. So they could look at all of this stuff and wade through those, you know, 5 million reports every day. And instead, maybe they narrow it down to 100,000 reports that seem somewhat legit, where someone is consistently getting reported for AFKing or inting, and some of these other uh, gameplay metrics are coming into play too, like uh, proximity to teammates, uh, deaths increasing over time in certain games, selling items, 
um, in certain games and just overall doing stuff that seems like it could be a pattern of intentionally not trying to win the game. Um, Riot, Riot should not mandate the meta. So this is something that is difficult. You know, off meta and for fun stuff, I think should not be punishable. So this is kind of what I was talking about earlier with the Nubrak thing. It's like, that, that one's really, like, that's probably one of the most edgy cases in Singe support. It's like, should that be punishable? Um, the big thing with that is he was going middle. Like, if he just played Teemo support in the bot lane, I think 100% not punishable. He's just playing a, a weird champ that's not good, but if he's trying to win, that's okay. The problem was he was going and, like, going to mid lane and trying, like, changing the way that games work and what people expect to see in master challenger level games so that's a little more rare but in general i think they should not ban weird stuff people just like doing it that's sometimes it's creative that's how new stuff is found um in the game and there's a dodge feature now once again this is tough for challenger and masters because you know, sometimes they dodge, but it's especially if they're streaming, it's really bad to dodge because they're going to have it already took them 10 minutes to get a game. Now it's going to take them another 10 minutes every time they dodge. So if you have a bunch of people going like Teemo mid, it's not a great solution to dodge every single game because their viewers are just going to get annoyed by that. Oh, you got an egg for daddy? Are you going to eat it? Can I have a bite? Um, but. For the vast majority of the population, um, I think that, you know, that's fine. If people are playing off meta or stuff they don't have experience on for fun, I think that dodging is there for that. If you don't want to participate in that, it's like, yeah, they can pick it if they want to. That is cool. That's a good job, Rory. Okay, hang on just one, one more minute, okay? Daddy's almost done. You want to watch a song? You want to watch a song? And then after the song's done, we get chocolate chips? No. You don't want to watch a song? Uh, yeah. Yeah, you do. I want to watch it in my house. You want to watch it in your house there? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I got to cheese. I want the baby one. You want Humpty Dumpty? No, I want a baby one. You want the baby one? Yeah. Okay. Oh, Sorry, this is in the middle of the day. Now you do want Humpty? Okay. That's very consistent of you. Can you say I consistent, Rory? I want, I want to watch it. Okay, go ahead. All right. Um, so, anyways, but that's why dodging is there. You know, yes, they, you know, they have a right. It's not really a right, but Riot gives them the privilege of playing. You know, what they want, even if they don't have experience, even if it's not going to be good. But I think that other people in the game should also have the privilege of having access to that information. Right now, you have to use poor professor and stuff like that, saying, "Hey, this person's yolo queuing. They're playing something they don't know how to play, or they're playing something they have a twenty percent win rate on out of a hundred games." Um, I don't want to play that. So they could dodge. And I think that there should be a penalty. I think it should start at 5 LP and go to 10. Um, but I don't think there should be a timer for that. I think maybe you get, I don't know what the number is, but a maximum of, you know, a certain amount per day, maybe five per day. Or just always make the timer five minutes. Because I think the timer, the thing is you don't want people just constantly spamming dodge just to annoy, like, the cues. But at the same time, I feel like a 30-minute lockout is a bit extreme and forces high-low people to have smurfs. Because if you take a 30-minute lockout and you're trying to stream, you just can't do that. Um, so it's just really bad if you have to do that. So I think having a 5-minute timer is enough. And a lot of people think it's a huge penalty to pay 10 LP for a dodge, and most people won't do a 10 LP penalty anyways unless it's like the hardcore trolls that are dodging. And then once again, if someone dodges like maybe just limit it, say like 
I don't know what the number is, three to five per day per account or something like that. But either way, I think that dodging should be there, and I think it's a necessary way to deal with people that are for funding or off metaing, and that's just a much more reasonable way to deal with it, right? Like it's hard to come up with a definitive no, you can't play Team Omid, no, you can't play Singe support. You know, it it's so you just can't define that without killing the creativity of the game. So you have to let other people in the game read that information, interpret it, and just say. I don't think that's going to be good. I want to, I'm willing to sacrifice my LP so that I don't have to play this game. Okay, so it, it's a penalty. People don't want to do that. It won't increase the queue times too much, but it is your way to deal with that. It's like in poker, you know, being able to fold poker hands, right? If you get dealt a 2-7 off suit, you should be able to fold that hand. Even if you're going to lose a little bit of your blind, if you're blinded in, you lose a little bit of that, that might be better than losing even more money eventually, right? And so it's the same kind of thing in League. I think people should be able to sacrifice a little bit to get out of those games, which they already do, and I think that's fine. You know, that, that's that's the way that I would regulate it. But, you know, for, like, chat, like, maybe once you get to Masters, they might have a certain level of etiquette. I don't know what it would be. Or, like, a special Masters Council or something like that made up of players that try to clean up the game and professionalize a little bit more i don't know i'm not 100 percent sure what that would be if it would be like oh you have to have a certain win rate on a certain champion it's just like how do you even do that i don't know but like the dodging works for most elos but once again for masters or masters plus it, it gets a bit tougher um duo boosting is basically impossible to regulate unless riot just gets rid of duoing um, I do think that duoing should be disabled in Masters Plus. Um, I think that's something that a lot of people complain about. It's just way easier, especially for ADC and support, to duo, to move up. So I think that is something that really throws off the cues, especially if it's like two challenger players duoing, then you're guaranteed to have two challengers on your team. And they've tried to, you know, match up duos a bit more. So if one team has a duo, the other team has a duo, but... I still think it's tough. I think duoing is fun. It's good to play with a friend. I think that in most ELO brackets, it doesn't substantially increase win rates. It's only in the case of boosting and only in the case of Masters Plus where it becomes a real problem. And both of those are extremely rare. Um, but it's just a fun way to interact with your friends. So I think duoing in general, and it doesn't affect statistically that much. I personally have a lower win rate with pretty much every duo I've ever played with. I either have a similar win rate to my normalized win rate or a lower win rate. I just do it with them because I enjoy their company and it makes it, the game just more fun. Um, and I think that's how it is with a lot of people. But um, anyways, I do think it probably should be disabled in Masters Plus, but you know that's, that's debatable. And then win trading is pretty much impossible to legislate. If someone is... I mean, I guess they could look and see if you play against the same person a lot and you have the same outcome against that person so like if person a plays against person b and person a beats person b like 10 out of 10 times over three days or something like that maybe they could investigate that as win trading but it's so difficult to like other than looking at something statistically like win rates because smart win traders are gonna do it in very subtle ways like they're just gonna happen to be out of position a little bit in a team fight or they're just going to happen to like not use one of their key abilities in a fight. Um, you know, maybe Tom Kens just accidentally forgets to eat his ADC when he gets caught. And so it's going to be almost impossible to differentiate bad play from win trading at high level. If you don't know what win trading is, that's basically it only works in like Masters Plus when there's a very low pool of people um, that are getting matched together. You want to go outside, right? Oh, I'm going to go into the. Her. You're gonna go with her though. No. Why not? She can't wear a mask and it's a small store and she would be she in the box. Oh, there she is. Being crazy. They close at six tonight. Okay. And it's probably gonna be too busy this week and they have a sale. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye. Love you. Um. Do what? That's right. Um. So anyways, it's just almost impossible to legislate that. And oh, ba 
what I was saying is basically like if you have person A who wants to get to um, Grandmaster and person B, if they're both in Masters right now, it, it involves Smurfs. You'd have to have each person has two accounts in like Masters or Diamond or whatever. Queue up at the same time, person A and person B. You hope to get on opposite teams. When you do get on opposite teams, then person B might do something to lose the game on purpose so that person A wins the game, basically. So it's kind of like boosting, but it's doing it in a negative way. Well, you might say, well, how does that, how does that work then? What does person B get out of that? Well, person B gets on their Smurf account, and then person A gets on their Smurf account, and then they, you know, person A then will give person B wins on the Smurf accounts, right, or on the alt accounts. So basically, people have multiple accounts. They use one count to go down, and they boost the other one up by intentionally throwing games, and then they flip the, they flip the script, and the other person will intentionally lose games, so the other person wins games. So it requires multiple counts, a lot of work, it's very very rare you know only near the end of the season when people are like trying to get into challenger and they just need like maybe two or three more games to get there that's when you might see some of the win trading but it's really really rare and does not apply to 99 percent of the population and boosting is quite rare too although you do see it like literal 100 percent someone is paying money for this account is rare right now someone just duoing with one of their friends who's better than them but not being paid or someone who's playing on a smurf account and is you know duoing with their friend you know all of that stuff i wouldn't consider that like being paid to get like literal boosted they're just duoing with a friend you know or they're just on a smurf okay all right but anyway so the some of these solutions are okay but some of these are just impossible the win trading and the duo boosting there's just not really a great way to deal with that um, Riot should just maybe look at the dodging system as a way to deal with off meta for fun YOLO picks um, and they should look better at like play pattern divergences and things like that to try to legislate stuff now I just want to like a final couple of things I think they should bring the tribunal back they used to have this all the way up through season like three or four and what this is is where Players look at information from other player games and they decide whether or not someone should be punished. So it's almost like a democracy kind of thing where a bunch of players are interpreting the gameplay of other players and they're deciding whether or not they should get punished. I think in theory, this is a really good system because then you have humans looking at other humans and you're crowdsourcing it. So then Riot doesn't have to spend $3.1 billion on rioters. You can just get your community to try to legislate it themselves to a certain degree. Now the problem with this back in the day was you would have a lot of false positives. People would just go in there and they would just click punish, 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 punish on everything and um, you would get, a lot of people would just get punished. Um, and what they used to do is you would log in to a separate like tribunal thing with your league information and every um, game that you evaluated or every case that you evaluated, they would give you something like the equivalent of like 15 blue essence. Or something like that so you could do up to like 10 or 15 per day so you would basically you could spend 15 minutes and get the equivalent of like maybe two or three games worth of um, blue essence so you got a little bit of a reward it was more efficient than playing games in order to get some of that currency but you had a limited amount that you could do every day so um, people would do it for the reward but you know how do you get around these false positives well I think that you um, implement a couple of um a couple of systems here to help like a five-step system for potentially uh punishing people or banning people number one give people um warnings so use some of the current automated systems optimize them like i just mentioned before look at, at play pattern recognitions you know look at their chat for certain words ai can do this stuff um the afk system the gameplay system like i said proximity to other champions selling items <clears throat> Uh, all of that kind of stuff, and then warn players. Just say, hey, um, your play pattern suggests that maybe you're doing unsportsmanlike behavior. Um, we're just warning you that if this continues, um, your gameplay will go to the tribunal, okay? And then they, then they would know, okay, oh crap, they're on to me, they know that I've been AFKing, they know I've been talking all this trash to my teammates every game, so maybe I better chill. So you could give them a warning like that first. Step two, 
if the whatever the pattern is continues then you could send it over to tribunal and what they would uh, in order to be eligible for tribunal you have to be honor level three which means you played the game a little bit let's say at least 100 games and you haven't done um, too much toxic behavior then you could get to honor level three so that means that it can't be like a brand new account it has to be level 30 has to be honor level three at least 100 games so it can't just be someone makes a whole bunch of just smurf accounts and spam stuff it has to be people that are like committed to the community um and then you would have 10 people look at three games so they would create a portfolio of three different games such as what they used to do you'd have three different games and 10 people would look at them um every time it would look at chat log which is what it used to do it used to tell you items um and maybe tell you their match history so you could see is this a pattern you know are they and maybe allow them to click on different match histories if they want to look at it just link their op.gg or something like that so then people could say oh this person's lost 10 games in a row or whatever and it looks like they're 0 and 10 in every single game um you know that type of stuff then it could look like intentional feeding or you could look at it and just see okay this person is like you know on a little bit of a loss streak they've lost six out of their last 10 games but there doesn't appear to be a clear pattern of inting right like this one they're two and six but the next game they are you know 10 and two and the next game they're you know four and six you know just so you could get some context like how is this person doing are they on a loss streak are they tilted is this just one bad game is it seem very clear that they are throwing games through some of that stuff um and then they would pick choose to punish or pardon right so does this person deserve some kind of punishment or is this a false positive positive? and then seven out of ten people would have to report punish in order for it to go to the next step so that's a pretty large majority 70 percent of the people looking at the information have to believe you were doing something that was unsportsmanlike in order for you to go to stage three stage three would be a rioter review so a rioter would personally review it after it has all the tribunal information and then after that um they could do uh they could choose to pardon or punish so this would filter it down a lot so you would have the ai filtration system there to detect a bunch of the cases so you don't have to wade through the five million things you would now be able to just cut that down to maybe one million from five million and then you could have the community peer review it what and how many that get peer reviewed would actually reach that seven of ten threshold would probably be pretty low um, you know, maybe it goes from 1 million down to 20,000 or something like that reports per day. Then you could have rioters look at that. And then the budget for something like that, you know, if you had, you know, whatever the number was, if you had 20,000 and they looked at, um, you know, what did we say? Uh, five per hour, eight hours, that's 40. That'd be, um, you need 500 people at 25,000 a year. That's 12 and a half million. So that's a lot more, that's still a lot of money, but that's a lot less money than 1.3 billion. So now for 12, 12 and a half million, you don't even have to pay the peer review people. You just give them blue essence or some in-game currency. And then now all of a sudden in that, you know, very reasonable scenario there, you would only have to pay 12 and a half million to your quality assurance team you know to look through these games every day and um you know clean up your game for 12 and a half million i think that'd be really good you could probably even get it lower than that i mean i'm assuming that you know they're getting paid twenty five thousand dollars or twenty five thousand a year which they could get paid less than that and i'm assuming that they're taking 10 minutes per you know um game where they could do it fast they could do it like five minutes probably do what okay just one second we're almost done um and then after that, then it then you could go through the punishment system. So they could get an official warning from a rioter, maybe first. They got these warnings, then it went through, and then a rioter could personally send them an email and say, hey, like, you were voted, you know, just basically show them what showed up in the tribunal. Just say, hey, these are the games that people looked at. This is what people said. Nine out of ten people believe this is toxic behavior. Um, if you don't fix this then you're gonna get a uh, temporary suspension. The next step is gonna be a two week ban. We hope that you'll fix it, but um, you know this is what we have so far. And then after that, if they keep doing it, two weeks, and then after that, perma. Um, 
So I think that would be good. And then they could have, at all of those steps, they could have a detailed report, like I just said, a tribunal report and maybe a paragraph or two from um, the rioter. And then they would have an opportunity to appeal. So maybe, um, you know, they could send something back to the rioter, like they could respond once to the rioter with questions or some other information that's not well known in the report. And then the rioter could make a determination, is this fair, is it not? If they think that maybe they send it to a different rioter, someone who looks at appeals, and they say, hey, look, this report is wrong because of this, you get a third party involved. This, you'd have to hire more people for this. You could get a third party involved. They could look at it, you know, they could look at, you know, just look at it one more time. Look at the tribunal report. Look at the rioter, what the rioter said to them, the rioter's paragraph, have a fresh interpretation, and then this third person could choose to uphold the appeal, um, or uphold the punishment, still give it out, or uh, pass it on to somebody else. Maybe you could say only appe appeals are only valid for permas, or appeals are only valid for the two-week suspension. I don't know. But maybe just allow the ability for a third person to look at it if the uh, player requests that. Okay, anyways, this is a super long video. It's way longer than I intended, but I guess we'll go ahead and stop there. Um, I was going to do a video on smurfing, uh, but maybe I should just do a separate video on that. Basically... I'll just do a separate video, but I think that it makes sense, especially for high level content creators to do Smurfs and a lot of that comes into one trick problems, dodging and all that stuff. And I'll, just stay tuned. I'll do a separate video for that. This one's already way too long. But anyways, so my general take is I don't think League is that toxic um, in general. I think that a lot of people believe that it's toxic because of... Um, you know some of these things we've mentioned the dunning kruger effect negative bias requisite improvement autofill and then just the nature of it being a competitive complex team oriented game with anonymous um relatively anonymous players and just having unrealistic expectations and then i think that riot is somewhat limited in what they can do yes they can do some of the stuff that i mentioned but some stuff they just can't do anything about like um, unrealistic expectations and inconsistent community people just playing suboptimal stuff, people just always thinking that they're better than they are and wanting to blame teammates. And there's no way Riot can fix a lot of that stuff. Things they can do are better AI recognition, like we just mentioned before, recognizing gameplay patterns, and then bringing back the tribunal system. Um, MidBeast also made a great suggestion where you could tie your account to a phone number, and they never give away that phone number, they never call you, they never do anything with it, but you have to have a phone number to sign up, therefore, all the Smurfs aren't anonymous. So if you get a perma ban, then all of, everything's gonna be banned. All of your Smurfs are gonna be banned. So then they could allow Smurfing, but it wouldn't be anonymous. You would be tied to a number. So if you get permed, you're gonna have to get a new phone number before, and you could do that. You could get another phone number, but that would be much, much more of a hassle to try to do that. And I think that that would clean up a lot of stuff if people knew that they could basically be blocked. Um, or it would be a huge pain in the butt um, to just make a Smurf. But anyways, that's going to be it for this video. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to like and subscribe if you did. Um, and check out the rest of the content on the channel. I'll see you next time.